I'm Brian Pupa, Executive Director with the Legacy Project. Welcome to everyone this morning. Uh, we're, we always start with a little perspective in time and place. As scientists tell us there are more stars in the universe than grains of sand on all the beaches and deserts in the world. So here we are in this immense universe that's 13.7 billion years old, surrounded by billions and billions of sparkling stars on this tiny blue dot we call Earth in the intriguing vision of a country called Canada. I'm coming to you from the greater Toronto area, specifically our site, the Cedars, which is at the headwaters of the Beaver River on the traditional indigenous territories of the Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabeg, Mississaugas of Scugog Island. And we gather in the spirit of being in the right place at the right time with the right people doing the right thing. Uh, this session is titled, A Bioregional Approach to Regenerating Our Land and Water. It's clear we're in a poly crisis, converging climate, environmental, economic, political, technological, social, and health crises. And there are no simple solutions, and this session doesn't propose to offer any. Uh, this is about designing a pathway forward with a new understanding of current local and global challenges. The seven generation work in the greater Toronto bioregion is part of the first North American cohort of a global bioregional activators network. And this is an opportunity for us here to both lead and learn from other bioregions around the world. Uh, the seven generation greater Toronto bioregion initiative draws on the seminal 1992 regeneration report by former Toronto mayor and MP, the Honorable David Crombie. In his report, he defined the Greater Toronto Bioregion as bounded by the Niagara Escarpment on the west, the Oak Ridges Moraine and Lake Simcoe to the north, and the Moraine to the east, and Lake Ontario to the south. And we're honoured that both David Crombie and the Honourable Pauline uh, Browse are serving as honorary ambassadors for Seven Generation GTV, and we're honoured to have Pauline with us this morning. Uh, she's a former federal minister of the environment. She was one of the founding members of the Save the Rouge Park Alliance Board and has been a passionate champion of protecting and restoring the sensitive ecosystems along the Rouge River. Her work resulted in the creation of Canada's first urban national park in the Rouge Valley. So I'd like to invite Pauline Browse to say a few words. Well, thank you very much, uh, Brian. Uh, I'm very excited about uh, this legacy project and having had an opportunity to meet Joe Brewer uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, I became even more excited about what we can do. We've got some great building blocks here already. We've got this wonderful farmland in the north part of the, of the bioregion. We've got the Negra Escarpment on the west. We've got these wonderful hills of old Northumberland on the east. So we do have some natural building blocks, but we also have some really good things that have happened. We've got the waterfront trail all along the Lake Ontario, which is uh, the Waterfront Regeneration Trust has been doing. The Conservation Authority has been doing wonderful work in terms of the Meadowway, as well as many other projects. And of course, I really do think that the focal, the anchor of this uh, of this bioregion is really the Rouge National Urban Park of 20,000 acres of land that so many people have been working in order to, uh, to make this happen. So uh, where do we go from here? This is our, this is our job. Uh, we've got some really inspiration from, from Joe and Brian and, uh, and uh, really the whole group that is working on this and most appreciative of, of York University, the City of Toronto and the City of Markham of, of funding this. So we've got the, the political issues. We've got hope that the decisions are being made properly. We've got the economic issues to think about, the cultural issues, but we've got a great legacy that we can work on. And I'm very excited that uh, we've been able to, uh, to uh, get this initiative underway. So thank you very much and, and good luck to everyone. Thank you very much, Pauline. Uh, at this point, I'll bring in researcher, educator and founder of the Legacy Project, Susan Bosak. Good morning. 
So context is everything. I'm here to provide a little bit of that. The Legacy Project is a research education and social innovation group. We've been around for 20 years. We've been doing research and development uh, on different aspects of the seven generation work with funding from United Way, Trillium, ESTC. And now we find ourselves in a moment of both coherence and opportunity. So the work we do is systems complexity work, which means you probably won't understand everything this morning, which is fine because it is a very different way of approaching things. You also may wonder, okay, is this really connected to what I'm doing? And yes, it is. Otherwise we wouldn't have invited you. It is certainly about your thing, but it's how your thing is connected to everyone else's thing. And those relationships and dynamics between all the parts Often the parts are doing great work, but we don't do a good job of connecting all the parts so that they can work systemically for more meaningful impact. In the systems work we do, we talk about systems dynamics, and we're using two systems dynamics. The first one is we're using an intergenerational dynamic. Anthropologist Margaret Mead said that connections between generations are essential for the mental health and stability of nations. Think about that, the mental health and stability of nations, that's big stuff. And in indigenous cultures, they will tell you that if you want to do something that makes a difference, that really gets something done, that you need to bring together a fired up youth and a feisty granny. And that's how you get things done. There's this dynamic power in intergenerational connections and relationships. So we can find comfort and well being in these relationships, which is important in a time of uncertainty, but we can also find power and we can find insight. And this allows us to get into communities in a very deep and authentic way. So that's one dynamic that we use. The other dynamic is place. And it's a very specific understanding of place. And that's why we have Joe Brewer here today to talk about place in terms of bioregion. So the intergenerational and place-based dynamics ground the work. It gives it energy and it's a way to affect not only grassroots community, but also leadership and policy. So we're going top down and bottom up at the same time. Seven generation GTB is about social regeneration, generations in community. It's also about ecological regeneration, community in bioregion. We're doing this complex dance between mitigation, adaptation, and seed. So again, this is both broad and deep systems work. This could, I think, fundamentally affect how the GTA moves forward, connecting it into the Great Lakes Basin, connecting it into the continent, connecting it into the planet in a very meaningful way. So this is big stuff that we're talking about systems, planetary systems stuff. With that, I would like to introduce our guest speaker this morning. He's a transdisciplinary scholar with a background in both earth sciences and cognitive sciences. He's currently doing on the ground regeneration work in a 500,000 hectare bioregion around Barichara, Colombia. And he's helping to create a global bioregional network. He's founder of the Design Institute for Regenerating Earth and author of the Design Pathway for Regenerating Earth. And I personally know that he loves to pull invasive grass. So he's got his hands in there. I'm very pleased to turn it over to someone that I respect for his genuine dedication to the ecology and the wisdom of the land. Joe Brewer. Uh, thank you, Susan. That's so sweet. I want to begin by um, introducing two of my colleagues who are here. Uh, one of them is here on the screen with me. This is Penny Hypo, and she's my partner and my partner in crime. Um, we're, we're collaborating together. We live together in Colombia, and we're now traveling around giving all of these talks and engaging with lots of people. And um, just to mention, her work is more focused on sensing and listening into the field and then also into body-based healing practices and how we deal with collective trauma. 
And so uh, individual and collective trauma, since they're often very strongly connected. And then also Benji Ross is here on the, on the call as a participant calling in. He's currently in Arizona, although originally they're both from Colorado. And, uh, and Benji helps us a lot with uh, well, a lot of things, but I think the most powerful thing is he's really good at holding the campfire and gathering people into meaningful human dialogues that connect into the conversations that matter. And what I wanna to do today is have a conversation that matters. Um, part of my background is I grew up on an industrial chicken farm in Missouri in the United States, which means I grew up hating farming, um, but liking to live on the farm. And it was because I saw, I, I intuitively understood that we were doing things wrong and we could do them better. And so when I went to college and then to graduate school and studied earth system science, later cognitive and behavioral science, and then later cultural evolution, it was all in service to understanding the mix and mess of challenges that we face. And so what I wanna to do today is give a presentation that'll last for maybe about 45 minutes. That'll give us a really nice context and a container for a conversation. And then we'll have plenty of time to talk after that. And so I wanna begin this presentation by saying that um, the focus that I have for us this is sort of like giving away the, the punchline of a joke, is that I feel like the nestedness, the embeddedness of our context is where we find the solutions. So we don't find them in any individual level, but in the interactions between the levels. And I'm gonna to try to make that clear today. So with that in mind, I'd love to get started with the presentation portion. And the main thing that I wanna say is that as we're doing this work to, to really get us started, is that it's really important to hold in mind that everything is somewhere and everything is connected to something else. So today we're gonna to talk about a bioregional approach to regenerating land and water. And this means that we're going to be talking about how landscapes are embedded within cultural narratives, cultural histories, ecological histories, and also cultural and ecological futures. So the context of a bioregion is that it is a continually unfolding story. And we're gonna really see that today as we explore the story of how these Great Lakes and the local region of the greater Toronto area are embedded within a larger story. With that in mind, I wanna remind us of something so basic that we could easily forget it, and so basic that it affects everything. And that is that if we look at the earth from space, we'll notice that it is an integrated, holistic, dynamic, evolving system. If you look at the earth from space, like this satellite image from NASA, you'll notice that everything is connected to everything else. There are no walls, there are no partitions, there are no political boundaries. Just look at the water. The ocean covers most of the land surface. And then the place where there are continents is spattered with lakes and rivers. And then the clouds are swirling through the air. The water is touching everything. This insight about the interconnectedness and the inherent and natural holism of the planet is something that tells us that no place is separate from its larger context. And this is gonna be really important for bringing a bioregional approach to how we manage landscapes. With that in mind, I wanna remind us of something which is really important. And that is that when we work on a project that is place-based, whether it's a small garden in our backyard, a permaculture farm, a large regenerative agroforestry system, or a massive scale conservation effort, that that plot of land is so complex and so rich that we need to give all of our energy to just being sure that it's well. And so what I've seen as I've traveled all over the world is I've seen a lot of great projects on a plot of land. What I haven't seen so well is where those plots of land get connected to their larger ecological connections. For example, there may be a great permaculture farm that's in a watershed and upstream someone's dumping pollutants into the river. And that plot of land where the permaculture is being practiced really doesn't have jurisdiction, power, or capacity to participate in cleaning up the river upstream. 
So this insight that the land is always embedded within a larger web of ecological connections means that there is an opportunity and often a necessity to collaborate from one project to another in order to serve the health and well-being of those ecological connections. But then those ecological connections are embedded within holistic landscapes. Holistic landscapes could be things like the drainage basin for an entire river system, or the plate tectonics and drainage associated with a mountain range, or the ocean dynamics and marine life and coastal dynamics of a coastal estuary. That in every case, the project that is located somewhere on the earth is embedded not only with its larger ecological connections, but those ecological connections achieve a kind of holism at a scale of an entire landscape. But the landscapes are always nested within planetary processes. And those planetary processes can be extremely important. So something that's happening on a piece of land in a landscape where there's regeneration or conservation occurring may be damaged or harmed by instabilities or breakdowns in the larger planetary system from things that are occurring somewhere else. And it's this insight that we're going to look at landscape regeneration and landscape conservation through these nested levels that we can begin to see the power and I would argue the necessity of the bioregional approach. Before we do that though, I wanna give us a sense of the challenge and why we need to work on something as difficult as what I'm about to share with you. And to be able to do that, I want to use a framework that I find very powerful, and that is the framework of planetary boundaries. So planetary boundaries is a framework developed by the Stockholm Resilience Center. It's a collaboration of more than 3,500 Earth system scientists. So this is by no means or in any way a marginal approach. This is mainstream, advanced, very well-established science. And the way that the planetary boundaries works is this. Back in 2009, a group of Earth system scientists came together and they asked a question. They said, what do we know about how the dynamic Earth works today that would tell us if there are any thresholds or limits and that if we crossed those thresholds or limits, our globalized economy and our globalized civilization would be called into question. So they went around and gathered the information and they identified that there are nine planetary boundaries, nine earth system processes or capacities that if you crossed a critical threshold, the entire game of global civilization is called into question. So this is a really big deal. Naturally, after they identified the nine, which I'll name in a moment, they asked the second question, which is, okay, how many of them have we crossed? I'll come back to that in a moment. First, let me name what the nine planetary boundaries are. You'll see that climate change is one of them, but it's only one of the nine. Another is biosphere integrity, which is a way of saying the loss of species or the uh, mass extinction that is beginning to occur. The third is land system change, which is taking complex established ecosystems and degrading them, which might be done to clear cut forests for urban landscapes or housing or for agriculture or desertification, it's land system change that reduces and degrades the health of the landscape as a whole. Then there's freshwater use. Then there's biogeochemical flows of phosphorus and nitrogen used to make synthetic fertilizers in industrial agriculture, which when they run off in excess, cause massive dead poles, uh, dead, po dead zones in the world's oceans at the mouths of the rivers. Then there's ocean acidification, Atmospheric aerosol loading, which is just another way of saying air pollution. Stratospheric ozone depletion, because the ozone layer protects the land surface of the Earth from dangerous ultraviolet radiation. And then there are novel entities, something that's introduced that the Earth system can't process or handle. So with these nine planetary boundaries, they asked, how are we doing? Which ones have we crossed? And in 2015, they identified that we had already crossed at least four. It wasn't that there were only four crossed, it's that the information and the state of the science was mature enough that they could say with certainty that we had crossed planetary boundaries for climate change, biosphere integrity, land system change, and biogeochemical flows. Recall what I said, if we've crossed even one, then global civilization is called into question. 
But then the scientific community kept going and research continued. And in 2021, new studies came out showing that we had also crossed the planetary boundaries for freshwater use and ocean acidification. And then in 2022, they identified microplastics as a novel entity that's so ubiquitous that you'll find it in every glass of water and in the breast milk of every mother on earth. And that it's a hormone disruptor and it's causing problems and so on. And so now we can say with confidence that we've crossed at least seven of the planetary boundaries. So the question becomes, how do we manage the complexity of a destabilizing earth system when what we do is we work at the level of projects and landscapes? And that's what we're gonna talk about for the rest of our time today. And the way that I wanna tell this story is I wanna show how what happens in one landscape can connect to another landscape through indirect processes of the larger earth system as a whole. I wanna tell a story of interdependence. And this story takes place in Sub-Saharan Africa. Here on this map of Africa, you can see the area colored in blue, which is called the Sahel Desert. And the Sahel Desert is, in normal everyday language, we say it's the sub-Saharan part of Africa. But the Sahel Desert is an area that had something happen that reveals this planetary interdependence. So I don't know if you remember all of those starving kids and all of the need to raise money and to bring food and supplies to people all over sub-Saharan Africa in the 1980s and 1990s and early 2000s. But you remember all of those starving kids and really starving people of all ages? Well, do you know what caused them to starve? Because I didn't. And I was amazed to discover that it took 50 years to find the answer, to say why was there mass starvation in Sub-Saharan Africa in the late 20th century? The answer is this. From 1870 to 1940, Europe, was rapidly industrializing. And as they began industrializing, three cities, the cities of London, Paris, and Berlin, began building factories and burning huge amounts of coal. The coal that they burned had sulfur in it. And so when they burned this sulfurous uh, coal, they released sulfate aerosols into the atmosphere. Now this map that you see is actually a map of sulfate aerosols today. And what I want you to notice is that the mixing of sulfate aerosols is creating this big circulation, this spiral that touches from Southern Europe into Central and Southern Africa. Well, this was also happening from 1870 to 1940, which means that the sulfate aerosols that were released by the burning of coal between 1870 and 1940 were having an indirect effect which is that when sulfate aerosols get into the atmosphere, they help form clouds and they change the lifetime of the clouds at different elevations. Lower clouds burn up more quickly, higher clouds last longer. And this changed the distribution of heat in the atmosphere over Europe. And then that had the effect of shifting the weather patterns to the south in a place called the intertropical convergence zone which then shifted the weather patterns of what's called the inter, inter um, uh, it's not the, it's the intertropical convergence zone for the Tropic of Capricorn in, uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, which means they shifted the weather patterns in a cascade from the lower latitudes of the North to the lower to mid latitudes of the South. And this is what happened. The Sahel Desert in Sub-Saharan Africa had a very stable and consistent monsoon. And you can see it here in this green graph in the bottom of the image, that between 1950 and about 1965, there was rain all the time. It came like clockwork. And then starting in 1965, the rains began to weaken, and they shut off completely by 1970. The Sahel monsoon shut down, causing agriculture throughout Southern Africa to collapse and leading to violent wars, genocides, and mass starvations. What is now known is that the Sahel monsoon shut off because of that cascade of causation from the burning of sulfurous coal from 1870 to 1940. So this was invisible because the chain of causation was multiple different causes spread out in space and time. It spread over a long distance, a distance of about 8,000 kilometers north to south, 
between Southern Europe and, and Central Africa. It was delayed in time by a century. The industrialization began in 1870 and the accumulation up until 1940 meant that the monsoon shut down 30 years later in 1970. So people didn't know what the causes were. And that means there were interwoven narratives. Different stories were being told in different places at different times, and none of them could see this big complex picture. And of course, there was a lot more than this going on too. But the lesson for us is this. The earth is a whole system with cascading relationships and time delays. Because of this, breakdowns unfold across space and time. And so this breakdown that unfolds across space and time places us at a profound kind of systemic risk. And what we're going to do today is talk about how to create systemic resilience with the same capacities of the earth which is these interdependencies that we now know and that we increasingly understand as there are new advances in earth system science. So to begin talking about how we apply a bioregional approach to landscapes, it's important to remember something very important and fundamental, which is that everything happens somewhere. So where are we right now? We're right here in the middle of the Great Lakes, just north of Lake Ontario in the greater Toronto area. We're in the middle of a, or we're in the midst of a large continent surrounded by two oceans on either side. And we're already seeing from the previous example with the Sahel monsoon that there are invisible patterns of connection and interdependence that place this region at risk or that this region could in the future help to stabilize. To help us get more familiar with where we are, I just wanna ask you to think about this question because you can see that here in the greater Toronto area, we're embedded within a very important larger system, the Great Lakes. And if we ask ourselves how much water is in the Great Lakes, I've been surprised to learn that a lot of people don't know the answer to that, but also that what, it's, what it signifies about this place on the planet. You see, the Great Lakes, hold about 20% of all the fresh water on Earth. This is significant because 99% of the water on Earth is salt water in the world's ocean. Only 1% of the world's water is fresh water. And of that 1%, 20% of that water is in the Great Lakes. So just for perspective, this is the same amount of water as the entire Amazon rainforest. And now we all know that we need to protect the Amazon rainforest. It's a global asset of great strategic significance. But look at this, nearly half of the fresh water on earth is held in the Great Lakes together with the Amazon rainforest, which means the Great Lakes in their own way are just as important as the Amazon rainforest for the entire planet. So it's not just that you know, Lake Ontario is important to Toronto because it's on the edge of the lake, or that Toronto is close to the Great Lakes, so we care about what's happening with our neighbors, is that this is a strategic planetary reserve with no parallel. There is no other Great Lakes on Earth. There is no place with this concentration of surface water. Even the Amazon, for it to gather the same amount of water, needs 200 river systems spread across half of a continent just to give you a sense of the concentration of this land area. And you can probably already see that what I'm doing is I'm preparing us to think about bioregions because I want us to see how the place we are is embedded in something larger. But then how do we draw the boundary for our bioregion? And this is where we define a bioregion. Bioregion is just a shorthand word for the phrase biological region. And so a bioregion is the entire context in which a life system can function for an entire biological population. And I think this really gets clear by saying that the entire life system of an organism and their whole population has some kind of a geography. And for me, I like to think of this with a, a simple example to really understand it. So I like to use starfish as my example because starfish have a very well-defined geography. All starfish on earth exist within what is called an intertidal zone of a coastline. This is a picture from the coastline of Oregon. 
And so this, what this means is that the entire life system for all of the starfish is between the low water mark and the high water mark of the tides along a coastline. Everything they need to eat, all of the places they need to sleep and have a home, to reproduce, their entire life system is embedded within the intertidal zone. And the intertidal zone defines the bioregion for the starfish. I say it in this way because there's a history of bioregionalism that treats it as though it's a political movement, like the back to the land movement or a sovereignty of local people that's opposed to nation states. This is what happened in the 1960s and 70s. But actually, a bioregion is a technical term from ecology. It's a way of saying, what is the biological geography for the entire population of a species that allows you to understand how they're able to sustain themselves and survive into the future? Which means for us to create sustainable human economies, by definition, they will be organized as bioregions because a sustainable human economy means the entire life system is sustained within the geography that is holding it. And so this concept is really powerful for helping us see the whole systems of life for different organisms. So what is the role of regenerative bioregions? I like to use this map of Africa because we all know Africa as a continent is huge, mind bogglingly big, so complex, it's hard to wrap our heads around it. There are 55 nations in Africa, it's so big. But if you look at it the way that it's envisioned here, where someone has visualized all of the river systems, and you look and you see, well, there might be 200 or 300 rivers, there might be 400, but the continent has naturally organized itself into its watersheds, which means if someone wanted to regenerate and restore the health of the entire continent of Africa, they could set up projects in each of the watersheds and each watershed could work on the holistic health of the watershed. And there might be 300 or 400 projects that collaborate together to restore the entire continent. And this reveals the power of bioregions. Bioregions are coherent ways of understanding geography for the life system of the land itself so that humans can align themselves with and co-create with the holistic system of the landscape. So if each bioregion is a whole system, then it can be a whole system model, meaning we can actually model it computationally or conceptually. We can model it for its own regeneration. Said another way, we could study something like a watershed for a river, and we could say, this river is a whole system. It's not healthy. How do we understand how to make it healthy again? And we need some kind of scientific model, some kind of narrative model, for what the health is of that whole system. And then we can begin regenerating and restore its health. Its health. And so if human beings organize ourselves into bioregions, then we can actually create a planetary network of bioregions and cultivate learning exchanges between them. So that the greater Toronto area, if you all choose to form a bioregion, can collaborate with other bioregions to restore the health of larger systems that you're embedded within. And this is how systemic resilience can arise through those planetary interdependencies. What needs to happen is this. We need to recreate the conditions for living locally in terms of material flows, integrated life systems, thriving of families and communities. And if you look at a map like this one, this is a map of ecotypes or ecozones, which means each area is colored differently according to the type of soil it has, the type of local climate it has, and the type of ecosystem that naturally occurs on it. Because there's such a diversity of ecotypes, it shouldn't surprise us that there should be a diversity of local human cultures and local human economies that can organize themselves to be in harmony with the type of landscape that they're in. And this means that the bioregional approach, understanding there's a natural geography for biological regions, allows us to integrate ourselves into the type of landscape that we live within, and then create an economy that is in harmony with it. Back in the 1970s, there was a famous study called Limits to Growth, which was the first ever computer simulation of the global economy to see how the material flows moved. And what they found was that there was a future collapse 
They came out of their computer simulations. So they started a 10 year process with some of the best thinkers of their time at major universities around the world. It was a group called the Balaton Group that did this research because they initiated at Lake Balaton in Hungary. And after 10 years, a summary was written up about what they discovered. Vernon Rutten was an agronomist, so he's an agricultural economist, who was part of this research group. And this is something that he said. He said, each agroeconomic region is so unique that the concept of transfer of technology is irrelevant. What's relevant is the transfer of the capacity to develop technology and institutions that are consistent with the cultural endowment and resource endowment of each region. And then Danella Meadows, more popularly known as Dana Meadows, had this to say, because she was the leader, uh, the lead person of this research project. She said, out of these 10 years of work came a vision of a number of centers where information and models about resources and the environment are housed. There would need to be many of these centers all over the world, each one responsible for a distinct bioregion. This essay that she wrote came out in 1983, 40 years ago. Can you imagine 40 years ago, the best thinkers of an entire generation asking how do we achieve planetary sustainability? And they universally agreed the only way to do it is to create local living economies organized as bioregions with bioregional learning centers that model and guide their evolution as local landscapes. Notice that this doesn't say carbon dioxide emissions. It doesn't say electric cars. It doesn't say how to participate in the global economy. It says create local living economies organized as bioregions. 40 years ago, I was six years old when this report came out. So what we've discovered between then and now is that this is still the best idea around for planetary sustainability, but it completely disappeared from the policy landscape. This leads to the work that I'm involved with in Barichara, Colombia. What you see here is a topographic map of Colombia, and you can see the Northern Andes where they divide into three mountain ranges. And right there in that big turn of the Northern Andes is a 500,000 hectare integrated landscape that has its own regional climate system. And it's a regional climate system because of the shape it has as a bowl within three different mountain ranges. And we're working to regenerate this landscape as a bioregional economy. And so we're taking this idea very seriously and moving forward with it. We're establishing our own bioregional learning center called the Barichara Ecoversity within this landscape. And one thing we've done in the last few years is we've identified projects that exist within our landscape. We formed relationships with them. We're creating a territorial foundation which is a community foundation that can help organize and create synergies between them. And what you see here is a sampling of the local projects, just to give you a sense of their diversity. So we have the Barichar Ecoversity at the top, which is a bioregional learning center to help integrate the knowledge about the landscape as a whole. There are projects like Ojo de Agua, just here on the left, which is a community theater where children learn about mythologies and stories and indigenous traditions and develop nature connection through the performing arts. There are projects like Fundacion Monte Chico, which is trying to preserve local cultural knowledge of native plants and how they relate to textiles and natural fa fabrics, teaching children from the elders of the community. And then there are projects like Agua Santa, which is here on the left, which is a network of 14 agroforestry farms, all of them doing regenerative agriculture, collaborating together to restore watersheds, build soils and promote food resilience and food sovereignty for their territory, and on and on. But what I want you to notice here is by having a list or even a collage of photos for these different projects doesn't tell you how to organize them. And that's because they have a natural way that they're already organized. And that is that they exist within a landscape. So here is an image I took from Google Earth, a satellite image. Bar HR is this town in the middle. And you can see that all of the yellow uh, areas are locations of the different projects. Some of the projects are side by side. Some of the projects are in different parts of the landscape. 
and their connectivity or their lack of connectivity is what we look at to ask how they should collaborate with each other. The point here is that the landscape itself offers organizing principles for how existing projects can work together. What you can see in blue are two very important features of water. The, the long elliptical uh, area in blue is a ridge line that has an aquifer system, and that subterranean water is the permanent water supply of the village of Barichara. And then the, what you see in the lines in blue are three of the tributaries, they're actually 15 tributaries of the Barichara River, which is a dead river because of, agri um, of deforestation, erosion, contamination that needs to be restored. And you can see there are natural patterns of connectivity in the features of the land that relate to the shape of the land and the movement of water. And so we can start to organize the projects around the functions of the landscape by taking a bioregional lens and asking ourselves, what is the holistic system for life for this landscape as a whole? And this way of thinking tells us how to encourage collaboration between the existing projects and how to create new projects to create synergies between the existing projects that don't exist today. So the lesson is this, the very same interdependencies of the earth that cause systemic breakdown and risk are what allow us to create resilience. See, creating resilience in our local place is a process of nested regeneration. Here in this vision of, in this image of the earth, you can see Sub-Saharan Africa and you can see Europe to the north. And remember over the span of a hundred years, the industrial activities of Europe caused mass starvation and genocide in Africa. What are the future risks of you that you have here in the Great Lakes because of these kinds of distant interdependencies? How does the nested nature of your reality create risks for you? And how could the nested nature of reality create resilience for you? This is the question. And so I want you to see that this way of organizing a continent around watersheds applies to all continents. Here is South America with all of its river systems. Notice that the Barichar Ecoversity is up there. That's where we have our own bioregional project regenerating 500,000 hectares of land. Those 500,000 hectares, as big and inspiring as it is, could not possibly regenerate the entire continent. But the Amazon River Basin is actually 200 rivers. So what if other landscapes organize themselves as bioregions too? And we start to collaborate with each other and we move up and down the Andes and up and down the Amazon and up and down the other river systems. We can start to cover the continent with interdependent and related bioregional regeneration projects. And in this way, we could regenerate the entire continent of South America. So now back to where we are. Here's Toronto and Lake Ontario. And I know you all are very aware of this, that you have one of the coolest landforms I've ever seen. You have a giant sponge, a giant sponge called the Oak Ridge Moraine. And this giant pot sponge is so big that first it took two and a half million years to form as ice sheets ground up the rocks to make gravel and, so and sand. And also I had learned from Wikipedia that this was the source of 29 waterways. But then I went to the Oak Ridge Moraine website and saw that there were actually 69, or no, 64. There were 64 waterways flowing out of the Oak Ridge Moraine, which of course is part of the green belt that you have here. And so you have this incredible, almost embarrassing abundance of water because of this giant sponge, which means the greater Toronto area is very well positioned to have water security. And so if you organize yourselves as a bioregion to really build this strength, you can start to work on the nestedness around you. So here you are in Toronto, over in the lower right, but maybe you wanna to start to weave the waters, collaborate with people over in Lake Huron or Lake Erie, or just right up above you in Lake Simcoe and start to see that you can collaborate with these larger watersheds because the Great Lake Basin is a planetary strategic asset. 
You might also realize, oh, we should collaborate with those people down in the Finger Lakes. They're just across the Lake Ontario from us. They have a different landscape, but we're actually all in this together. And by the way, those are some of the people that could receive the climate refugees from New York City and from, uh, from Boston and from all of New England. That would mean less of them come and disrupt your landscape. And maybe you could help them to do that by collaborating with each other. You might work with sister cities like Cleveland down on Lake Erie, where we already know that Brian and Susan of the Legacy Project are collaborating with people down in Cleveland. Penny and I are going to Cleveland next week to have conversations just like this one. Maybe you collaborate with them to set up sister bioregional projects. And of course, you have in your backyard the largest forest on earth. The boreal forest is twice the size of the Amazon. It spans the entire Arctic Circle, thousands of lakes to your north in Ontario. How could you form a relationship up to these larger scales to try to build nested resilience for the forest to your north, the Great Lakes region as a whole, and stabilize some of the risks at the larger continental scale? Well, here we are in North America. Once again, the continent is divided into naturally occurring watersheds. So there you are in the Great Lakes. You could start exploring how neighboring bioregions can collaborate with each other across the Great Lakes. But if you were to travel across Lake Huron over to the westernmost part of Lake Huron, you would arrive in Duluth, Minnesota. Do you know what Duluth, Minnesota is? It's the headwaters of the Mississippi River. Imagine if people start setting up bioregional projects up and down the Mississippi. Penny and Benji and I are already collaborating with people in the headwaters of the Colorado River down in the southeastern, southwestern United States to start working down their watershed in the same way. And now what we begin to see is a continental strategy for nested resilience. Each bioregion is building its strength collaborating with other bioregions to learn from them and to help them, and forming networks naturally organized by water up and down the continents. And then, of course, we could do this on every continent on Earth. And this is how we can regenerate the entire planet, one bioregion at a time, woven together into tapestries of flowing water across the land. This is the most coherent and logical way that I've ever heard of for creating planetary sustainability. So how might you imagine bioregional learning centers and collaboration among projects in the greater Toronto area? Would you organize them around the Oak Ridge's moraine, for example, some of these other lakes, some of the watersheds? How would you do, how are you already organized? as a bioregional learning center? How are you already organized as learning communities for this kind of work? What can the Green Belt do to organize this nested capacity for resilience? How can the Green Belt become an anchor from which to build outward all the way to the Great Lakes and possibly all the way out to the continent of North America? You know, when I looked at the Rouge Park and I looked at a map of it, I was like, wow, this is amazing. Can the Rouge Park weave into a bioregional pattern or is it already a bioregional pattern? How does the existence of something like the Rouge Park increase cultural coherence so that people in different neighborhoods in different cities and different jurisdictions can already come together and collaborate around the conservation patterns of the Rouge Park? And how could they do that for other parts of the Green Belt? See, where we are in Barichara, we've identified territorial patterns that are inherently bioregional. And I'll just give you four examples to see how this, how this thinking works. In Barichara, we have a lot of dead or very sick rivers. So we focus a lot on the restoration of entire watersheds. We don't have the embarrassment of riches you have with water. We're in a landscape that's becoming a desert. So we're setting up community water councils, member owned aqueducts for management of healthy watersheds and engaging in reforestation projects across those watersheds. Those reforestation processes include a learning center in Centropic Agroforestry. So we've created demonstration sites and workshops to spread a reforestation approach 
that is a blend of native forest and agroforestry, which means it blends into regenerative agriculture. So that in those forests, we can grow textiles, we can grow medicinal plants, we can grow food, we can grow construction materials. Many of the main material flows we need for our local economy are in the agroforestry systems themselves. So in your conservation areas, are there places where there are already farms that are not set up to be regenerative that could become part of a bioregional regeneration strategy that includes the design of alternative economic models? Because see, we're also working on investigations in solidarity and community exchange that keep the financial flows in the local economy. The global economy is designed for those who have financial capital to extract materials from one landscape sell it into another landscape, and then store it in a Swiss bank account or in a tax haven. They extract wealth from local places and put it somewhere else for private gain, weakening and stealing and hoarding the wealth of local places. The bioregional approach is to say, how do we create a robust and strong local or regional economy that doesn't weaken in time in this way? And then in Bari Chara, we're also focused on the transformation of local food systems to build up food sovereignty. So it's interesting to notice that Ontario is a food desert, because as I've been learning from some of your farmers, a lot of what's grown here is F1 hybrid corn that is used as feedstock for cattle or is used as inputs for industrial food processes, and it's not edible for humans, which means like I grew up in Missouri, there are these massive food deserts in the middle of the farmland because humans can't eat what's being grown. That this idea of transformation of local food systems from a bioregional perspective makes so much sense that we need food sovereignty and food security in every bioregion on earth. Otherwise, the hungry people with pitchforks are going to come invade you when they're starving, exactly like what happened in sub-Saharan Africa. And so the transformation of local food systems is a climate resilience strategy, as well as just a good idea. So you can see these territorial patterns help us see how to organize what is already present in our landscapes for the kind of work that needs to be done moving forward. And then there's the framework <clears throat> that can help us understand how to do this in practice, the framework of integrated landscape management. I really like the model that was developed by Common Land Foundation because they work on projects that are at least 100,000 hectares in size. They're working in 16 landscapes around the world at present. And they've created a model that's called the five, they call it the 54320 model. And it looks like this. They've identified five landscape processes. The five landscape processes is that it's a multi-stakeholder collaboration. So there's a need to establish a landscape partnership. That landscape partnership is able to reach a shared understanding about what the landscape is, how it came to be the way it is today, and explores possible scenarios for the future. From that learning process, they build a landscape plan. Then their landscape plan, they need to be sure there's a landscape team that ensures effective implementation of the plan. And of course, with something this complex, you're continually monitoring, evaluating, learning, and improving what you're doing. And these are five landscape processes. And then they found that there's a really great power in having a shared language about uh, how it's about a lot more than financial returns. So they created a thing called the four returns, which is that yes, there are financial returns, but there are also natural returns, which is ecological benefits, social returns, which is economic and social well being. And what they've discovered is the most powerful return is the return on inspiration, which is the engagement and the empowerment to participate that arises through this local work. And one thing that's really important is that integrated landscape management includes having different zoning for the landscape as a whole. And just to make it easy to understand and then hold the complexity in the landscape itself, They've simplified the three zones, the zoning into three zones, a natural zone for conservation, a combined zone, which is where there are things that are for ecological benefit, but also human benefit. So this is where you might find um, like intentional communities and eco villages, agroforestry, uh, reforestation efforts connected with regenerative agriculture and so on. And then defining where the economic zones are for human use that you can increase the densification of those areas by having transfer of rights 
between the different zones. And they find that this approach works if you do it for a minimum of 20 years on a minimum of 100,000 hectares of land. And this is the 54320 model of common land foundation. What's amazing about this is that it allows you, this landscape model allows you to create a landscape fund that is modeled off of a very recognizable large scale fund, which is the fund that you would create for any large infrastructure or public works project. So if you were to create a regional transit system or a light rail system, it might cost two or $3 billion and it might need to last for 30 or 40 years. You would need a core team that's basically the project management team to oversee the, the uh, development of the plan, the construction, the implementation, the maintenance and the continual improvement across those 20 to 20 years or longer. So they found that to fund these landscape processes, there's a need for a minimum of $2 million per year for the core team. So you do the math, for 20 years, that's at least $40 million. And then on top of that, you need separate funding to build the ecosystem of supports. In this case, regenerative projects within the landscape that are helping to restore and regenerate its capacities. But because those projects are not profitable at the beginning, and many of them are public goods, they need philanthropic or other kinds of governmental investment. Unfortunately, most governments don't understand this model, so they tend to be the laggards. As you can see, the government, the government support doesn't start normally until eight to 10 years in. They didn't design the model this way. This is just what they've observed in practice. Because what they found is only after about eight years is there enough dynamism and capacity among the regenerative ecosystem that a regenerative economy is able to take hold. And when that regenerative economy takes hold, it generates revenue and a tax base for local governments to reinvest those taxes into the regenerative economy. And so this is a way of building a regional economy at a very low cost. You can imagine this might be $1 billion spread across 20 years, less than it costs to build a light rail system to create an entire regenerative economy for the entire bioregion. This is the model that Common Land has developed and that they are prototyping in the real world in 16 landscapes around the world, mostly in Europe and Africa at present. And our work in Barichara in Colombia is about to become one of the next ones. So what's really powerful about this is the bioregional approach does something else too, is that the bioregional approach is a story of place, which means it engages the cultural identities for diverse members of the community. I'm showing this picture with my lovely uh, friend Alun right there in the middle as he's walking toward the camera, because this was an activity we had in Barichara called Pasos de Agua, which is Spanish for the, the path of water or the steps that water takes, because there's a group that's taking children to walk the dead river of the Barichara um, watershed and work on restoring it. And this ability to say, we as the people of this territory care about our rivers so much that the children and the adults, the elders, the wisdom holders from the indigenous traditions, they can all come together and work on restoring the river because of the cultural identities, plural, diversity of cultural identities that exist in, in place. The bioregional approach gives you a new way or many new ways to engage the community in civic action and in conservation practices in citizen science projects, and in collaborative community projects. So this is something that comes in as a very powerful element of telling the story of the people of your place. So the critical question I have before we get into our discussion is this, is there enough interest and enough commitment to attend future meetings and expand into a discussion of a bioregional learning center, ecoversity, or just generally this approach? You see, this is what Legacy Project brought Penny and me to do. We're on a tour of bioregional activation this week and next week, starting in the greater Toronto area. Then next week, we go to Binghamton and Ithaca in New York, then to Cleveland and Ohio, and then back to Rochester, and then we fly back to Columbia. So we're not gonna be here. We're passing through. But Brian and Susan are here. All of you are here. Is there enough commitment to come together and explore a nested 
bioregional strategy for your own bioregion of the greater Toronto area together with the larger Great Lakes region. Could the greater Toronto area be a co coherent bioregion as David Crombie said back in that 1992 report where he defined the bioregion in this way? Pauline, who's here on the call, was part of the group that did that, so she could tell you this isn't a new idea. But is this maybe a good idea for the time that we're in right now? And so as I go back to plant trees and do my fun things, play with my daughter again, I miss my daughter while I'm away from her right now. The question is, are you ready to become an earth regenerator? Someone who doesn't just do regenerative work in your local landscape or your local project, but that looks across these nested levels to the planet as a whole. Can you organize yourself into a bioregion? And are you ready to do so? That's what I'd like to talk with you about now. As you can see, by um, holding the conversation in this way, the important thing to recognize is that these nested interdependencies are what's gonna create the most danger for us in the future. But if we understand how they work, we can leverage that knowledge to not only protect ourselves against those risks, but to create a pathway to a thriving and flourishing future for humans and the ecosystems that we depend upon. And so I'd love to pass it back to Brian um, to, to help us begin the next part of the conversation. And then, and if Pauline has anything she'd like to share, I'd love to hear from her, but maybe I'll go to Brian first. And, um, and then I'd love to have a discussion with you about all of this. Yeah, thank you very much, Joe. Um, this has been a great um, thought-provoking presentation for all of us here. I know that uh, we have representatives from uh, multiple conservation authorities in the greater Toronto bioregion area, which is great. And uh, we have started conversations with a number of conservation authorities, Rouge National Urban Park, with the municipalities about uh, all coming together uh, in the seven generation greater Toronto bioregion. Um, we're using David Crombie's initial definition of the bioregion, but that we can expand, we can contract whatever the, uh, the collective group uh, feels would make sense given the current status of things here. Um, I know that um, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of great work that's being done out there with all the conservation authorities, with the municipalities, and uh, it's a matter of, of looking at that from a big picture perspective, involving the public in the seven generation approach as well, and uh, building something bigger and greater. Um, so I'd like to open it up. Uh, maybe we'll go to, uh, to Pauline first for her comments and then uh, feel free to, to raise your hand uh, to jump in after that. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, Joe, um, you just inspired me one more time. It's uh, it's really amazing what uh, what you have been able to put together, and uh, from the whole international point of view, and uh, and then bringing it right down to uh, what we can do, what we will do, and what we must do. Thank you for that, Pauline. Um, I feel like what I feel happening here is, firstly, uh, I'm feeling just a natural resonance between what you all are already doing which means that this is a very strong place to come together. And the other thing that I'm feeling is uh, that there is a long history to build upon from this. So this isn't like, how do we get it started? It's how do we bring the next level of coherence? And the next level of coherence is, is a question, like what is the next elegant step in building the capacities that are gonna be needed? And so it's gonna be very interesting for Penny and I when we go to Cleveland next week, knowing that Brian and Susan are already working with the team in Cleveland that we're connecting with, to just see you know, what are the interesting possibilities for connecting what's happening down on Lake Erie with what's happening up here. And we'll also be in Rochester. So we'll be on the, you know, I like to joke, you could throw a rock to Rochester from Toronto. It's so close. It's just across, I know the lake's bigger than that, it's my joke, but you know, it's, it's really pretty close. And so there's this interesting question of just what will be those relationships and how will they make sense when in the United States, the structures are really different. And so you have a, a fair amount of coherence, even with the differences that were named 
about how the different conservation authorities have their own nuanced structures, um, but they're largely compatible with each other. So there's a really good work that can be done here. And maybe what I think is, uh, I'll pass it back to Brian to, to bring us to a close for today. And um, for my part, I just wanna thank you all for letting me join you in your beautiful party that you have going up here in the, in the Toronto area. Brian, back to you. Uh, thanks so much, Joe. Um, this has been a great um, introductory discussion. Um, and this is a starting point. And I'd like to thank you, Joe, for sharing the, your big picture look at the poly crisis we're facing um, and the taking a bi-regional approach um, and a whole systems approach to addressing it. Um, I think this is a, a powerful starting point and we invite everyone to think about how this might apply in the work that you're doing right now. And uh, definitely email me to connect further. Uh, Clearly, we're going to have follow-on meetings after this week-long week, week -long series of events in terms of, of, of pulling this together and, and seeing where we'll, we'll all take it together. Um, we have been reaching out to the municipalities, to the conservation authorities, to Rouge National Urban Park, to others, other organizations. And uh, uh, if we the, the bottom line is if we focus on uh, our attention on generations in our place, I think that we can engage in more effective action and be uh, better prepared, more resilient in the face of, of what might be coming. So again, uh, thank you all for participating and I look forward to connecting with you very soon. <laughs>